We need to apologize. We're family, you know? And, and uh, it's, a, it's about love. God loves us. And uh, he is there for us in any situation. Uh, it was said in the Old Testament concerning the nation of Israel, what great uh, nation is there that has a God so near to them? Uh, but that was just a shadow of the good thing to come. So we could say as sons and daughters, children of God, it's awesome to know that we have a God who's so near to us and that he's our salvation in every situation, no matter what it is. And so I believe that what the enemy intends for good, he or intends for evil, God turns for good. I have a little testimony myself. I'll share. Bonnie's not with us today. She's at home. Uh, she had a little emergency surgery. Uh, I was, you know, I travel 60% of the time and she was going to go to Bulgaria with me. Um, I've been going there 33 years and she's never, ever been. So I finally talked her into going to Bulgaria. She was scheduled to go on a plane with me. And then uh, uh, just a few days before we left, she had a TMI. And uh, the good news was I was home. I heard her fall and I, I went and she was kind of using word salad for words. <laughs> So we went to the emergency room, and we were there for a very long time, a couple of days. The good news was they exposed what was going on. They found what was going on. And then the better news is uh, we're not limited to just doctors. Uh, we have the presence yes. of Holy Spirit. So, like you said, Lee, uh, Linda, you know, uh, Dr. Jesus is better than any other doctor. And uh, God told me that this year, prophetically, is a year to prevail. And it's a year of unexpected glory. And so last year was a year of unexpected turns. And he said if you act and not react, he will take unexpected turns and he'll work things out. I had a lot of unexpected turns last year in the lives of people that I know that turned out to be t testimonies of healing and deliverance and new vision. I've had ministries literally born again uh, especially in the in the nation of uh, Portugal and some really good things in Africa. So last year, that was the case, unexpected turns, but don't react, act. Faith is an action where fear is a reaction. And so last year, I practiced acting and not reacting. Then this year, God said, this is a year to prevail and a year of unexpected glory. Prevail means you overcome something. So, Angie, this is a year to prevail. God bless you. You're going to prevail. We're standing with you, okay? And Jared's going to prevail. You're going to prevail. We're looking for the God story. It's going to end in light. God's day always ends in light. The devil's day ends in darkness. God's day ends in light. Okay. I'm not leaving yet, but I think so. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. I can do that. Is that better? Yeah, that should be a little bit better. Okay. You tell me if I need to move it anymore. Okay, so uh, this year in prevailing, my wife had this situation, and 60% uh, of the time I'm away from home, so it could have been I wasn't there, but I was there. So thank you, Jesus, that I was there. Thank you that it happened a few days before we went to Bulgaria, uh, and not on the plane or in Bulgaria. Both of those situations would have been a bad situation. You know, we have a father who loves us, and when things are wrong in our lives, even medically, uh, God allows those things to be exposed and revealed so that he can work, so that there can be a testimony. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, Pastor Bryce would agree that every testimony includes a test. That's why they call it a testimony. Without a test, you're just a money, so you need a test, a money. So that was the first thing. And then the second thing was I was taking a team of four people with me to Bulgaria. First time in a while I was going to take a team. And so then my son Jonathan, Pastor Jonathan, and his family decided, well, we'll go too, but we're going to kind of go for a vacation. And he'd never been to Bulgaria. I've been going there 33 years, and my family had never been to Bulgaria. And so what happened is I have to cancel my traveling now because my wife is in the hospital being diagnosed, and, and uh, then she had to have emergency surgery. Her artery on this side was totally blocked and twisted, so they had to do surgery. So she's got a really great tattoo now, uh, but uh, her life was saved. And uh, we didn't go to Bulgaria. I canceled um, 
Netherlands, Bulgaria, and Portugal. I'm home right now taking care of my wife. I'm, I'm in everyone's church today, but uh, I'll, be, I'll be heading back to her immediately when meeting is done. But, but she's doing great, and uh, I can't tell any side effects at this point. Her speech is clear. Uh, her thought patterns seem to be, uh, I don't see anything that's uh, a lasting effect. And so God really intervened. Then my son and his wife, they go, and uh, the de- next day the team was going, and Lufthansa goes on strike, and so the team doesn't make it. So the only people who end up going are my son and his family, and he's going there for a vacation. Well, he gets there, and he ends up speaking in the church that I have in Sofia. Then he takes my place in the conference in Plovdiv for several days, and then he goes and he speaks in the church that I have in Blagovgrad. And so uh, the end result was they love him and they want him back. So, you know, I was questioning God, how will I transition the nations to the next generation? And God takes what the enemy intends for evil and brings another good thing out of it. So so I'm just saying, uh, don't look at any story by just what you're immediately looking at. Uh, You know, I, I just rejoice that God saved my wife's life. I'm absolutely convinced of that with the timing of it. Uh, when there's something wrong in your body, it's good to know that it's there so that Dr. Jesus can deal with it, so that miracle God can bring a testimony. Everything about life is about a, a testimony of life. Okay, So I am going to talk to you today about the process of due season. I've been writing blogging on Monday on due season, and uh, I'm going to uh, talk about that today. What is the due seasons of your life? The sunshine is out in Skagit County and Whatcom County. I got my rototiller out yesterday, being careful where I till, because it's a little early yet. Uh, but I uh, pruned my raspberry run and dug around my raspberry run and, and dunged, dug and dunged my raspberries. You've got to do a little digging, a little dunging to get some fruit. And so uh, I was working in my yard all day yesterday, and I bought some seeds at the store. And when you buy seeds on the back of the packet, it tells you how many days you can expect to have a due season. And for every kind of seed, there's a different length of days for the due season. It germinates at a certain time, and then it comes to, you can expect to be eating this after this length of time. So if it says 90 days, you're not going to be eating it in 60 days. Okay? If it says it's going to be 45 days, then you won't be eating it in 15 days. So there's a due season to expect the maturation of that seed. Now let's read some scripture. This this is in Galatians chapter 6. Commonly talked about sowing finances and releasing finances or increasing finances or reaping finances. And it can truly be in that context, but it's, it's about way more than that. It says, it's talking about people giving life. And so it says in verse 6, Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. So in that verse, between the lines, we see somebody is committed to giving their life to teach the word. Somebody's committed to giving life in the form of the word of God, in the form of teaching, in the form of helping us mature, in the form of helping grow. And then someone is also helping that person who's doing that in the form of making sure their needs are met, taking care of them, being a blesser. We could say today, uh, I mean, we had a little challenge uh, because uh, the worship team was was only four people. Uh, There was uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Tim up there. And and probably Tim felt a little awkward. And Tim is feeling, now he's running the camera. Look at this. I mean, you know, he's doing whatever he's got to do. Uh, he was praying a minute ago and giving words of encouragement. Now he's running the camera. He was up there with a the guitar doing some songs. and That's what family does. Uh, they do whatever is necessary. Some days it works really great. Some days it doesn't seem like it hardly works. And, uh, but that's what family does. Family makes lots of adjustments to help one another out, to give life to one another. And uh, so this verse 6 is really saying, There are those that are giving life this way, so others give life this way, so that life can happen. Now, then in verse 7, it says, don't be deceived, God's not mocked. Now, who is God? Did you know God doesn't need anything? 
He gives life, he gives breath, and he gives all things. He doesn't need us to worship him. His world doesn't change when we worship him. Our world changes. He doesn't need us to come together on a Sunday. But it sure helps when we come together for us. I mean, he doesn't love us more when we're good. And he doesn't love us less when we're bad. He just loves us. Now, he wants us to reap the benefits of what happens when we live connected to him and, and being life givers. Even when it comes to the anger of the Lord, the anger of the Lord is never, ever, ever against people. It's against wickedness and unrighteousness. Romans 1 says that those in the world are bound to wickedness and unrighteousness that suppresses the truth with a lie. What's the truth? God loves all people. That's the truth. God is the father of all people. That's how he sees people. But you have to be born again where you can see who he really is. Sin never stopped God from seeing humanity for who they're meant to be. That's why he sent his only begotten son. Because he saw people as his children. No, sin stopped us from seeing God for who he really is. So then we knew there was something more than us. So we began to think, well, there must be a God. Or we said, well, there is no God. And then we argued with the one that we don't believe in. Yeah. So we, we either argue with the one we don't believe in or we argue with the one. Yeah, question? Okay. And it's up to us whether or not we fix it or not. Mm-hmm. Okay. So here's how we're born. We're born, uh, we're, we're actually, I believe that all babies are born alive to God. Okay. I believe that all names are written in the book of life. However, your name can get blotted out. So you have to find God. Now there comes a point in life where you uh, have enough sense to know the knowledge of good and the knowledge of evil which is not how humans are supposed to live. They're supposed to live connected to the tree of life. So we're born in a world of sin, in an environment of disconnection from God, and we're born with iniquities. Now, iniquities are internal flaws that are weaknesses that are like a gift. See, I was born with a weakness that would be tempted to look for love in the wrong place. That's actually a gift. Because it's that very place that's going to make me cry out to God and know who he really is. Now, who is he? Well, he's mercy. He's love. He's forgiveness. That's the character of who he is. Yeah? So, I was born in a world of sin. But I wasn't born as a sinner. I was born as a person with iniquity who eventually is going to become a practitioner of sin. However, God in his love comes so that he visits my iniquity and he changes that weak area to a place of strength, a place of overcoming, a place of knowing him. And so I, uh, I don't believe that we inherit sin, we inherit the sin nature. And then we do sin. <laughs> we look for love in the wrong place. However, God loved us so much, he didn't condemn us. Our sin was condemning us. Our disconnection from God was condemning us. So God loved us so much, he came and became one of us, moved into the neighborhood, so that he could reconnect us to a relationship with God as our Father. So God is a giver. He gives life. He gives breath. He gives all things. So when he says, Uh, wickedness and unrighteousness suppress the truth. It's suppress the truth that God loves you. God doesn't hate uh, wicked or unrighteous people. He hates wickedness and unrighteousness, which is what makes people wicked. (laughs) And if you don't get free from that wickedness and unrighteousness, you end up living a lie. You end up living a false identity. You don't live as a child of God. You don't live as a son of God. You don't live as a daughter of God. You live as a lost person. And God wants you to live as a person who knows who you are. So in verse 7 of Galatians chapter 6, Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, 
that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. If you live for yourself, then you will reap the benefits of you being your own God. Right? If you live for the flesh, your own personal desires, then the highest call that you can attain to in life is your own desires. Whatever you live dependent upon is what creates you. That's why the very first, what looks like a commandment is, you'll have no other gods before me. It's not because God wants to control you or condemn you or restrain you. It's because he knows who you really are. He wants to create you. I'm 69 years on planet this year, 50 plus in Christ. And I'm learning that uh, at 69th year, uh, God is still creating me. (laughs) He's still forming me. Uh, I'm still having to face some challenges and having to get through. So the question is, am I going to get through my challenge as a giver or am I going to allow my challenges to make me a taker? Don't be deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever we sow, whatever we sow to is what we reap from. Okay? He who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Now, everlasting life is not just when we die. John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus said, This is eternal life, to know God the Father and to know Jesus the Son. Now, that's only possible by Holy Spirit, who's come in the name of Jesus. He's come in the character, nature, way, power, and authority. The manifest presence of Jesus is in Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit wants to be in your life, in my life. He wants to be in us. He wants to be with us. He wants to clothe us. He wants to be in our lives as a helper, a comforter, one who comes alongside of us. Not just to say, oh, it's going to be okay, but to bring everything that's from the giver of life in heaven into our earthly circumstance and situation and help us. He wants to take bad things and turn them for good. So everlasting life is a relationship with eternal life. Life that can't die. Which means every season of your life cannot end in death. Even physical death doesn't end in death. But there's a lot of seasons between now and physical death that look like death. But they're not intended to end in death. When you sow a seed in the ground, it looks like death. And when you reap a seed, it also goes into a container and it looks like death. But that seed has the power within it to become a greater harvest. Jesus said, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground, it remains a single seed. But when it's sown, it becomes up a great harvest. Now... Your life is all about harvest. So it says, let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season you shall reap. Now what's the due season? You shall reap. You don't know. (laughs) You don't know the due season of things that are sown into the Spirit. But there is a due season, and you'll reap if you do not lose heart. So I'm going to speak to your heart this morning. I'm going to speak to your heart that you do not lose heart. That in the Greek means that you don't grow weary, that you don't faint, that you don't relax, that you don't faint, that you don't lose heart. Because you will reap. The sign of the end of every age is harvest. The sign of the end of every season is harvest. The sign of the end of every year is harvest. Your life is meant to be lived as harvest. And all harvest is declared prophetically by a sound of a trumpet. Every season of harvest is a 
God speaks, life happens. God speaks, life happens. God speaks, life happens. Now, what's the purpose of harvest? Two things come from harvest. Bread and seed. Bread is to feed those in your world. Now, there's some benefits that come. Uh, You get to eat also. But bread is not... Your life is not, wasn't given to you for you. You weren't born into this world for you. You may have been born into this world for one person. But that one person is a one and only. You may have been born into this world for thousands of people. But those thousands of people are not more valuable than every single one of those thousands. And every season of your life is for harvest. For seed, that's something beyond your life. And for bread, that's life in your world. So when you're a little child, your life is about life. You are a little child. I have a a granddaughter. She's going to be four in a couple of weeks. She thinks she's going to be 25, but she's going to be four in a couple of weeks. And uh, she was born to bring life to her world. Now, she's a little child, so she gets it. She gets it. She doesn't try to pretend anything. But you know what? I tell you, Grandpa and Grandma feel really good when she comes over. (laughs) You know, we can feel old. But, yeah, she makes you feel young, doesn't it? You, You got it? We've got grandparents and great-grandparents. Come on, parents, you know. Children, they get it. Jesus said, unless you become like a little child, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. You see, children have an attitude of they know you're glad to see them. (laughs) And they know the simplest of truth that adults forget. And that is, they're born to be loved. And so that is the secret to harvest. That's the secret to germinating seeds, the secret to seeds sprouting up through the ground, the secret to plants growing in a garden, the secret to those plants becoming mature and becoming ready for harvest, and the secret for that harvest to be gathered to fulfill two purposes, feed what's in the world, And have seed to do it again. I was in my garden. I know I shared this testimony once before. But um, I love working in my garden. uh, Because um, I used to be a a spiritual spook. I I spent all kinds of times fasting and praying. And experienced all kinds of supernatural stuff. I love that stuff. But I got practically unhealthy. And so then God had me work in dirt. And I've learned that... Things that are spiritual are both spirit and natural. And I should be able to, uh, to change a diaper on a grandchild as easy as cast out a demon. And I should be uh, easy to heal a sick person as to change a diaper. The question is, what's needed at the moment? What's needed at the moment? What will bring life at the moment? You see, you came into this world to bring life into this world. Because your father doesn't need anything. He gives life, he gives breath, and he gives all things. And you live in a neighborhood with a bunch of neighbors that go through the same stuff you do. And so the question is, are you a life giver, an encourager, and a giver of life to people like you? You see, I used to think, you come to Jesus, you won't have any problems anymore. And then I found out you come to Jesus, you get more. Some people run away. They run away from the. They run away from the body of Christ, or they run away from church because they said there's problems there. Well, you know what? You can't run away from it. Of course, there's problems there. You were covering them. Up, you were covering them up before, but now they're getting exposed. Isn't that wonderful? You know, you'll never grieve the Holy Spirit when you make a mistake, an accident. You won't grieve the Holy Spirit. You get a bad attitude, you'll grieve him. But if you make a mistake, you won't grieve him. Uh, 
But if you get a bad attitude, I mean, you can even make a mistake. He comes and corrects you, and you're still okay unless you get a bad attitude when he corrects you. <laughs> so life is this journey. So it's about harvest. Every season of your life, you're a little child, you're meant to bring life to your world. A teenager, you're meant to bring life to your world. A young single adult, you're meant to bring life to your world. A married person, you bring life to your spouse, life to your world. You have children, your whole world changes now because now you get a revelation. The revelation is now, if you didn't get it by now, now you've figured out you, your whole life is consumed for the sake of somebody else. I asked my daughter how she was doing when she had her little girl and, and she, she kind of tearfully said, I'm just trying to keep this little one alive <laughs> because that's what life is when you know you're living for the sake of someone else. That's called harvest. Now, how can you not grow weary in doing good? For a due season you shall reap. Due season means somebody in your world is going to eat life because of you. And somebody beyond your world is going to bring life into your world because of you. That's your due season. And in that, you get great benefits. Now, even my little story I told you about, I didn't go to Bulgaria. I was, I was excited. My wife was going to go for the first time in 33 years. And, wow, this is going to be great. And so I got to look online at the pictures and the videos of the, of the conference. And uh, I looked at how uh, I listened to my son preaching and saw the people there. And the life of God was breaking out. And it, it just made my heart very happy made my heart happier than if I was there I'd have loved to have been there but man I, I saw life happened as though I was there and I wasn't there and I thought you know maybe after I graduate life will still be happening in the earth and some of it will be because of me I visit my father's uh, tombstone uh, once a year when I go to Wisconsin. I go there and visit a really good friend who's been my friend since we were kids. And we, I, we see each other once a year. we like eternal friends because we both know Jesus. <laughs> uh, he drove nonstop from Wisconsin to me one time to, to see me. And so I, I fly to him every year when I can. And, and uh, uh but when I go, I visit my father's grave, and I always laugh because my mother died in 1984, and so my father had a tombstone made with uh, her birthday, 1909 to 1984, and then his, 1909 to 19 blank. But he lived to 2000, so we had to get a new tombstone. So that's always kind of humorous to me. When I go there, I'm reminded that, oh, you, out, you were too stubborn. You outlasted your own tombstone there. <laughs> You thought you'd have gone sooner, but God had a, a bigger plan. And then uh, uh, there's a forest around my uh, the cemetery there. There's these pine trees, big, tall pine trees. None of those were there when I was a kid. My father planted them all. And uh, so now there's a, you know, there's a seventy-some-year-old forest that's everywhere there, and and it's green. And I look at that and. And then I say out loud, now my dad, my dad in the cloud of witness, I don't know if he hears me or not. I mean, I'm not having a conversation with that side. That None of my business yet. Uh, I know he's not in that grave. He's, he's, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And, and so, uh, but I talk out loud. It helps me process in my relationship with God. And I'll say something, I'll, I'll laugh about the tombstone and, and then I might say, you know, Dad, I don't know if anybody's going to visit your, <laughs> your grave this year other than me. Uh, but, you know, everybody that's driving by in a car is looking at that forest over there. And uh, so there's something in the earth that's alive because of you. And I just want you to know, here I am. I'm still here. And so I have an attitude that I am permanent in the earth. Do you have an attitude that you are permanent in the earth and you're permanent in heaven? Yeah? There's something of you that's always 
meant to bring life to your world. Amen. You were born to be loved, to be love to your world. Right and sometimes your world is tough. And that's because people in your world also live in a place that's tough. So the question is, what are we going to be in those situations? If we don't lose heart, we will reap a harvest in due season. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about the final moment, the final trumpet. You know, when your final harvest, you know, the, the final harvest, the seventh trumpet is your final trumpet. <laughs> your final harvest the, 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 the horn that says, you did it. <laughs> and you meet Jesus in the breath. He, he, he meets you in the dimension of beyond your wildest dreams. And I think with a cloud of witness that's been rooting you on. I know I've shared some of these testimonies. I've been around long enough to watch people transition. I've got great friends who are on the other side. I got lots of family members who are on the other side. I got sisters there. I got a dad and mom, and grandpas and grandmas, and and very good friends. One of my best friends went a couple of years ago, preached a great message on Friday, on Sunday. Uh, last trumpet blew on Thursday, <laughs> and it was a celebration on both sides. Tough on this side because when you're a life giver. Uh, you're missed. Yeah? But the due season is not just the final trumpet, but a due season is every season of your life is about bread and seed, bread and seed, bread and seed, bread and seed. Life and life, life and life, life and life. Everything. Now the question is, are you sowing into what can't give you life or are you sowing into what gives your world life? When we sow into ourselves, that can't give you life. You are not a good creator of you. You're not a good savior of yourself. You're not a good deliverer of yourself. But God, your Father, is an awesome creator of you. An awesome healer of you. An awesome savior of you. An awesome giver of life to you. In every season of your life. I'm in a season right now, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I spend my days, the last couple of weeks I've been, I, my office is at home, so I've been recording some videos while I'm home. Uh, that's in between uh, washing dishes, doing laundry, uh, making sure my wife's okay. <laughs> I'm getting to be a giver of life. Uh, I've, I've washed all my clothes, I'm about to pull out the ironing board, I'm, I, I've been kind of Pushing that out until I've got shirts I don't, you know, right on the edge. But anyway, no. And I'm actually, I'm, I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying my season because I realize, oh, it's just another opportunity for a different kind of bread and a different kind of seed. So. If we sow to the Spirit, we will of the Spirit reap the blessings of eternal life. This love with God the Father, God the Son. In 1 Corinthians 15, the end of it in verse 58, it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, your work in the Lord is seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Amen. And what's your work? You can give life to your world. Amen. What is the common scripture? Jesus said, anybody thirsty? Let him come to me and drink. And from inside of you will flow rivers of living water. I always like to take that word living and go, will flow rivers of life-giving water. I always exchange the word living for life giving because that's the nature of my father. It isn't just, you see, if it's flowing through me, it's not intended only to make me come alive. See, Jesus knows who we are. He knows we're sons and daughters of God. Like our father, we were put in this world to bring life to our world. 
life to people like us in an everyday world. You can reach people that no one else can. There are people in your world that no one else can touch. Some of them you might not even have a conversation with, but they're watching you. And no one else. They're not watching anybody else. They're watching you. And what's coming off of you determines life to them, inspires them to know who they are, and it's really about a love relationship with God. Thessalonians, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3.13, As for you, brethren, don't grow weary in doing good. Hebrews 6, 10 through 12 has some keys to not growing weary. God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward his name in that you have ministered to the saints. You've ministered to people who are set apart to God and you do minister. In other words, you, 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 you serve, you help. Uh, you know, you minister. Like, you know, Angie's going through a tough spot, so, hey, our hearts are for her. She shared her concern. We're going to take that concern with us. She's in our hearts. We responded to a, a, a concern. We don't need meetings that go clean and neat and always flow nice. Thank you. We need connections with human beings. Okay. And we don't, need, we don't even need to know what we're doing. We just need to figure it out as we go. I mean, does anybody know what they're doing? I, I don't know what I'm doing. After the fact, I think I do. It's like those Ikea things, you know. You, 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 there is an instruction that you can read, but you hardly ever do that. And you usually break one part when you're putting the thing together. And then when you get done, you're all excited because now you could do it again. But you never get to do that piece again. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. God's not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, and that you minister to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to f- the full assurance of hope until the end. We can say until the end of the ultimate harvest of your life. But how about every due season? How about every seed of your life, every season of your life? The sign of the end of the age is harvest. Even the parable of the wheat and the tares. Do we even understand that parable? You know, Jesus said that parable at a time when the old covenant was finishing and the new covenant was being birthed. And there were people who wanted the old covenant and they didn't want the new covenant. And so they were pretending to have the life of God when Jesus had come to finally give them the life of God. And it's a parable of wheat and tares, not wheat and weeds. A tear is a darnel. It's a type of grass that looks exactly like wheat, but it doesn't have any wheat. The rabbis would call that particular plant bastard wheat. That's what they called it in their Hebrew language. Meaning fatherless wheat. Meaning it can't, it can't produce wheat. It didn't come from wheat. So Darnells are a pretending I'm wheat when I'm not. And so Jesus tells this parable, and he says, well, so what, what, uh, what, what do we do? They said, what do we do? He said, well, you let the tares grow with the wheat. And then at the harvest, you gather the wheat and the tares, and you burn the tares, and you throw the wheat into barns. Now, anybody grew up on a farm like me? Okay, I grew up on a farm. We had barns. And we put wheat, or we put, oh, actually we had oats. We didn't grow a lot of wheat, but we grew oats. And we put the oats into barns. Now, why did we put the oats into barns? Because we needed certain segment of oats for seed. And we needed a certain segment of oats for feed. 
The only reason we put it into the barns was to feed and seed. Okay? And what wasn't feed and seed got burnt. Then in that parable, Jesus says, so it will be at the end of this age. What age? The birthing of the church age. The end of the old covenant and the beginning of the new covenant. He wasn't talking about the end of the world. Even Matthew 24, by the way, guys, when it says, what will be the sign of the end of the age? It's not world. King James Bible, I think, says we're at world, but that's a terrible translation. It's aeon, age. And, and the age that Jesus was talking about was the destruction of the old Torah temple system. We're finished with the law, and now it's time for grace, something that actually can change you. The manifest presence of God in your heart. You finally become the true temple, a dwelling place of God by His Spirit. <laughs> so, the ends, if you... in. Hebrews 10, for the full hope until the end. So the end, of, no matter what the end of any season in your life, the due season, that's the end. The due season, the end. And what's the purpose of the end? Seed for sowing and seed for feed. <laughs> life for your world and life in your world beyond you. Okay, then, and then he says... That you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now the greatest promise that I find in the scripture is the good news that was preached to Abraham. I think that's the greatest promise I find anywhere. Galatians said the gospel, the good news, was preached to Abraham saying that in him all the families of the earth would be blessed. And the good news was actually preached to Abraham when he offered, was willing to offer his son Isaac and God brought a substitute ram for his son and didn't require the sacrifice of his son but provided the sacrifice on his behalf. Then he preached the gospel to, to uh, Abraham. And this is the good news that he preached to him. You find it in Genesis. He said, in ble I think it's Genesis chapter 22. He said, in blessing, I will bless you. Uh, many translations say, I will greatly bless you. No, God is not interested in greatly blessing you. The word in the Hebrew is blessing, blessing. In blessing, I will bless you. When you know who you are, I will really bless who you are. When you know you are bread and seed, and that every due season of your life is meant to bring life to your world, I will really bless you to be you. On good days and bad days, I will bless you to be a blessing. Because that's destiny of a son or daughter of God. And it's a testimony of love. Faith is a testimony of love. You can't do faith. Faith is a supernatural response to the voice of God in your heart. Now you can position yourself to hear that. You can position yourself to study the word. Or if you're going through a struggle, study what God says about that. What does God say about that? What does God say about that? What does God say about that? Say about that? Until... You hear something in your heart. When you're going through something, don't study what man says about it. Don't study what man says about it. Be careful. You know? So, uh, Angie, don't do too many YouTube searches of what, what, what that condition is. Don't do that. Go, go see what God says about that. What does God say? What does God say? What does God say? Okay? And then listen in your heart because faith works through love. And faith is always toward a person, never toward a promise. So the promise was, in blessing I'll bless you, but Abraham's faith was toward the person who said that. The second part of it was, in multiplying I will multiply you. 
And that isn't, I will greatly multiply you. That's in multiplying, I will multiply you. When you live for the sake of someone else, not to add to your life, but to make someone else great. You live for your son. Yeah, you live for your children. You live, you live to make someone else great. In multiplying, I will multiply you. When your heart is toward someone else, I will make that someone else beyond you. I will do in them beyond what you could do in them. I will bring blessing. And I will, it, when you, uh, the, the promise is in, in blessing, I will bless you. In multiplying, I will multiply you. And it gets better. And your descendants will possess the gates of their enemies. A gate is a place of influence. There are some things in your life today that need to change. Right? A gate of the enemy is an influence of an enemy. Would you like those influences to change? Well, stop living for that influence to change. Live to be a blessing. Live to multiply. And what can't change today will change in the life of your children's children. And then in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Fourfold blessing. Greatest promise ever given. It's through faith that that promise is inherited. It's through hearing the voice of God in your heart. It's through patience. Ah. Now, what's patience? You know, patience is like endurance, but it always it, it, it's not like what the world thinks. Uh, because my worldly thoughts of endurance is, oh, I got to hold on. Or patience, oh, man, when's something going to happen? When's something going to happen? No. Patience, godly patience only works in the manifest presence of God. Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord, to wait. Isaiah 31. It's like a three-stranded cord. It's not waiting for something to happen. It's intertwining yourself with waiting on the Lord. Patience is a waiting on God and intertwining. Enjoy the moment. Enjoy the moment. In an unenjoyable circumstance, enjoy your moment with God. Um, I like what, um, you know, recently, some of you know Bill Johnson from Reading. I like what he said recently. Of course, he lost his wife. His wife transitioned to heaven. And uh, so he preached the next Sunday and, and was fully involved in church, didn't you know, didn't take a sabbatical and hide. And, and he shares that this is the most significant time of his life because he can't worship God at this level again. When you worship God in the point of pain, it's a gift. And his mentality is, I can only give, this is the first time in my life I've been able to give him this kind of a gift. <laughs> so whatever you're going through in life, patience is waiting on the presence of the Lord, being intertwined with him, and knowing that this is the moment where I can give him this gift. See, I'm going to sow some seeds pretty soon. I've got to put the brakes on a little bit because it's... I'll be a little early yet, and uh, but I did plant some lettuce and put some little Tupperware houses over them. So his lettuce is an early crop. I think I'll be okay there. But I had to put some Tupperware houses over them. 
Got to got to take care of the moment. Uh, but uh, it's through faith and patience. Both of those are relational words. Relationship. Faith comes by hearing. If you heard God yesterday and you wrote it down in your journal, and then next week you pull out your journal to see what God says, you're not being obedient to the faith. Because it's not rhema anymore. It's logos. You wrote it down. So what you have to do, it's good it's in your journal. That's like scripture. It's written down. It's logos, something that has been expressed. But now you need to go God again, go to God again and let Him speak it again. Let Him say it again in your heart. Faith is a constant hearing God in your heart. You know what happens when you wage war for a promise that God gave you 15 years ago? You spend 15 years <laughs> waging war. When you could have been experiencing due season in many different ways during that 15 years. Because when you plant a seed in the ground, there's a time where you don't see anything. And when you don't see anything, can you stand at the field and experience an intertwining with God and experience the joy of patience? Can you experience the life of faith? It's the opposite of natural sight. And then when it pops up out of the ground, oh, okay, now that's a little better day. Yeah, come on. But then you find out there's something that grows right next to it that looks exactly what you plant, like what you just planted. You ever figure that out? I mean, the counterfeit comes right up. In there. Do I pull it up? No. Bad. <laughs> I leave it grow for a little bit until you can get it out carefully. You know, so God, you know, faith and patience is a relationship. So it's in due season we reap, but it, it, it's through faith and patience. Those are issues of the heart. So in due season, the due seasons of our lives. What are we aiming at? What do we see as a conclusion? What's our definite goal? God's spoken to me many things. I've had many things come to pass. I've never had anything come to pass exactly the way I thought. And so, 13 years ago, I transitioned our local church to my son. He's the pastor of Abundant Life in Bellingham. I pioneered that church and pastored it for 20 years. And then God said that my son was the inheritor and that I needed to transition to my next season. When I planted that church, God told me that it was, my, it was a season. He said, you're not my first choice. You're not my second choice. You're not my third choice. You're not my fourth choice. You're my first choice. What does that mean? It means... Don't think yourself so great because you're either number five or you're simply in the place of grace. There could have been 50. It could have been 100 before you. But I've asked you to be it now. Until that due season was finished. And then my son was picked. And my ceiling, my roof became his floor. Which means there's a ceiling beyond where I could take that spiritual letter. And then God spoke to me. He said, I'm giving you another 20-year chapter. He spoke, I know I'm in a 20-year season. And he said, you're in a 20-year season of being a a equipper and resourcer to the body of Christ. And at the end of that 20 years, you'll transition that to the next generation and I'll give you your last assignment. I have seven more years in my season, my present season of equipping and resourcing. Okay, So I've been very busy equipping and resourcing the body of Christ. I do, that's what I do. That's the season I'm in. Okay, so I, But in that, there are many seasons. Now, my goal is to be an equipper and resourcer to the body of Christ. I do that out of relationship because everything I do, everything you do, has to be a labor of love. Not a labor of ministry. 
So you go to the people that God connects you to. Whether it's big, small, or one. Who has God put in your world? Who has God sent you to? Who has God joined you to? To be who you are for the sake of them being who they are so that life happens in the world. Seed and bread. Bread to eat and seed to sow. I'm in my neighborhood. There's nine houses in my neighborhood. I, I am on my block to activate my block to experience something of God. Now, I'm not trying to make an evangelistic project out of that, but I am having conversations with my neighbors and they know fully well who I am and what I believe. And they like me. <laughs> now, in my season, I have to be willing to be flexible. I just shared a testimony starting out about the, the medical situation that happened with my wife and I had to cancel being in the, the Netherlands at a critical time with a church that I work with a few times a year for many years. I had to cancel uh, being in Bulgaria, which I've been working with for three years. I was doing a conference and I've got three ministry, three churches I'm connected to there. And then I was going to Portugal to do some more video recording and do a conference with pastors in the north of Portugal. I did conference in the south in January. And so all of that was scheduled. And all of that fulfills my season of equipping and resourcing the body of Christ. Yeah? And then there's a challenge. Something stops, you can't go. It's through faith and patience that we inherit the promises. So what am I going to do? Am I going to say, well, I guess we can't go now. No, I'm going to take care of my wife, but I'm also looking at how do I fulfill my purpose of being a resource and equipping to the body of Christ when I don't go anywhere. So the course I was going to record in Portuguese, I recorded it in English in my front office. Uh, I took care of my wife. I made sure she had bread. And I sowed my life as some seed. (laughs) Uh, I'm I'm being a life giver in the midst of my adjusted circumstance, my adjusted situation. And in that, I see my son do what I would have been doing. And I'm thinking, wow, more is happening than would have happened had I gone. Because I have 20 years We'll have seven more years to transition it to the next generation. Wow, it's starting to get transitioned. And I also have found this year, I mean, I've got a ton of pastors in Angola. I've uh, ordained 20-some pastors in Angola, and they're doing the stuff. Okay, But my season, my general will is I'm going to be an equipper and a resourcer. I'm going to bring life to my world, basically, but I'm going to be true to who I am. How do I, you know, I used to be a UPS Truck driver, United Parcel Service. So my job was delivering packages. But my ministry was be a deliverer, a carrier of life. And I used to work in Fort Worth, Texas, and my delivery was 20 to 22 stops per hour was what I had to do in the city. That's not a lot of time at any stop. And at Christmas, I used to deliver 382 packages, 382 places, not packages, places, in a day. That's not a lot of time. But my goal was to be a life giver. So anytime I delivered a package, my goal was they needed to feel better about themselves when I left than they did before I walked in the door. So you know what I did in between? Oh, I sang in tongues, I I worshipped God, I rejoiced in God all day long. My whole day of delivering packages was nothing but prayer. All day long. And I would hop out of that truck, go in with a smile, and I would speak, I I wouldn't preach, I wouldn't be obnoxious. I'd just be a life giver. And sometimes I would, you know, I would say something like, yeah, you know, God's just really good. He loves me. You know, you, he loves you. I might, I'm not trying to be religious. Just being real, being a life giver. 
And you know what? They, they, they really liked when I delivered packages. I ended up being a cover driver, which I, I drove 26 routes. That meant somebody was sick, I filled in. If they were too much, I took this piece and that piece. So I got to see a lot of territory, 26 routes. And uh, I was like their favorite driver. Why? Because the life of God was in me. Uh, I used to be a, a cabinet maker. I've done a few things. I was a cabinet maker, and when I would do some uh, some uh, custom cuts out on the job, I used to have to just you know use a hand a free saw, circular saw in my hand, and and I used to do this when I did it. I say, God, this this is worship to you. Everything we do, we do with all our heart is unto you. So let this worship to you. Let this be. Just help me do this straight cut here. Yeah. And I used to do some really good work. And, I, and, and I, I gave God the glory for it. See, I can worship God with a, with a circular saw. Or I, I can worship God splitting wood. I, I used to split wood for a while. I, in the Northwest, I came here, couldn't get a job, so I ended up splitting three, four cords of wood a day. You know, that gave me tennis elbow real bad and short nights of sleep. But, and I'm not a big guy. I'm a little guy. But I did it as unto the Lord. So every one of us are in a season that involves a due season. And if we don't faint, if we don't lose heart, if we don't lose that place of connection with God where we can respond in faith, where we can be patient, experience His presence. Can you experience His presence? I, you know, in, in the emergency room with my wife, I'm experiencing his presence. I, if you're, you're home alone, do you experience his presence? In every season of your life, do you understand that that season is going to be seed for sowing and bread for eating? And something of you is going to bring life to your world in your day and the day beyond your life. That's what due season is. It isn't about what blessing am I going to get. It's about the blessing that you are. And you'll get blessed. But you sow to the Spirit even natural things. Your attitudes, your time, your giftings, your possessions. Let everything you do be for the purpose of being like your heavenly Father, a life giver to your world. So let me pray, because we're all in different seasons, different. What is the season of your life? Your season won't change, but what you do in that season, you might have to adjust how you do it. You start from the moment of sowing. It goes to a time of reaping. And in between, there's a whole lot of hoeing and cultivating, watering and time. And, but you've got to have faith and patience, which are both relational. They're about love. They work through love. They're a connection to God as your Father. So, God, we come to you. Every one of us in this room is in a different season of our lives. Uh, a different measure in this world. Some of us are in a delightful spot. Some of us are in a little tough spot. But all of us are your sons and your daughters. And we were born for such a time as this, first and foremost, to be loved by you, to receive the life that you give, the breath that you give, the partnership that you bring when we partner with you, so that we can be sons and daughters. So I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal yourself in us, with us, upon us, in the fullness of who you are, the helper that you are, the comforter that you are, so that there won't be anyone among us who will faint, but that we will see the fullness of our due season, bring life to our world. Help us to even see the practical things of our life in a way it empowers us to sow to the Spirit so that we will, of the Spirit, reap this eternal life, a knowing of you as our Father, a knowing of you, Jesus, the Son, and intimacy with you so that we will see 
It's glory to glory and glory to glory. Life to life and life to more life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Enjoy your due season. Don't grow weary. You'll reap. When the germination time leads to the fullness of the harvest time. Harvest is not in the fall. It's during the whole year. That's why I put some lettuce in the ground. Because I'm going to eat it before I eat corn. (laughs) Okay.